This podcast is being recorded at the Motion Picture Institute, the oldest film school in Michigan, training the next generation of filmmakers today. Check out the website, motionpicture.edu, and schedule a tour now. All right, guys, and welcome back to the show. Today, I have a guest that I am super, super stoked to talk to. David Bateman is an award-winning composer and multi-instrumentalist. He has written music for countless features, TV shows, and ad campaigns, including Homicide Hunter, Killer Siblings, The Daily Show, Deadliest Catch, Dark Fields, and A Girl Like Her. His composition style is a unique approach in creating musical textures, making offbeat and imperfect instruments in his cinematic orchestral writing. David resides in Detroit and works remotely from his home studio. It is a phenomenal time to have you here, sir. So, without further ado, let's talk motion picture. David, I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. That's great. So, I want to kind of like dive straight. You had a experience working here at the Motion Picture Institute. Can you kind of walk me through the, the stages of that? Yeah, I, uh, I knew Doug and Kurt from working on um, a movie, Dark Fields, a while ago, and then uh, Kurt had asked me to maybe step in and do a course on post-production. So I gladly accepted that and a bit of a challenge, you know, because I hadn't done anything really like that. And uh, yeah, just kind of jumped into it. It was rewarding. and Yeah, because you're, you're self-taught, right? Yeah. So how mm -hmm. does that come about? How do you get into music? And then from music, how do you get into composing for films and TV shows? You know, I always played music, and I've always loved movies. And when I was younger, I saw, uh, like, Poltergeist, and I loved the music from that. And I discovered Jerry Goldsmith, and I'm like, you know, and then Danny Elfman, these other composers. I'm like, this sounds really good. You know, how do you do something like that? And um, more and more people I would talk to. And then I had a friend went into film school and I just kind of followed his coattails. He needed some music for his thesis film. So called me up and you know, wrote some music for that. And I fell in love with the, um, the process of getting the music on tape and into the movie and stuff like that. So we worked together till this day and you know, one thing led to another and here I am. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that's interesting. So, I mean, the, the emphasis on building strong relationships early on. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And I, I would love to know how that's, you know, furthered your career. How many of those relationships have been integral in you finding work and keeping busy? Huge. You know, that, I mean, being a guy in Michigan working on movies that are shot in L.A. and New York and not being in those hubs, you know, mm -hmm. is tough. But once you meet the right people, and it's very cliche, but it's who you know. You know, and they trust you and value your work, your work ethic. And, um, you know, you're with a team. You know, I'm like working with a producer. The actor of that movie is also a director and producer. And then he calls me up for some jobs. And it just keeps snowballing after that. And it's just led into this, you know. Yeah, that was my next, my next question was going to be like, when did you find like your career started like having an uptick? You started like getting regular calls. When did that start to happen? It started like around 2015 ish. And was there a certain project that was the catalyst for that? Yeah, I would say I worked on a movie called Blue Line. It was Tom Sizemore. And I was always a fan of Tom Sizemore. And um, I got this call from a producer because I would send out hundreds of emails, cold calls you know, from IMDb or whatever. And one responded and it just happened to be this movie blue line and through that i met a couple other producers and directors and we've been working together ever since uh, one director i think i've worked with 40 movies since then wow another producer another 40 movies i mean it's just crazy can you walk me through that you see you did a lot of cold calls so you would just send like emails through imdb yep i would try to find the email the contact information of producers or studios? Yeah, producers, uh, directors. Production companies? Production companies. When I got into it, I started figuring out it's not the directors you need to contact. Mm. It's the producers. And Well, no, it's not the producer. It's the executive producer. No, it's the line producer is in charge of this. You know, So it's like you're learning all these different angles and titles and trying to figure that out. That was part of the game. 
how many years did you do that for? Once all paid off. <laughs> uh, eight, ten. Okay. You know, don't give up. No, I love the message <laughs> behind that. That's actually, I don't think I've actually met someone who's done that. That's very interesting. Can, yeah. Can you tell me what went into one of those letters? Like, how would you write it I out? I would just, like, introduce myself, um, said what it is that I do. You know, I would research... Um, what they had in production. So each email that I would send out was personal. It wasn't like it was like a, a template. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it was a little template, but then I would put in a little blurb of like what they're working on. I feel like I would be a great fit for your production, for your movie, you know, things like that. Try to grab their attention somehow. And then it, when I started doing that, you know, they were big emails. And when I get an email like that, my first thing is I don't have time to read it. I just, you know, I'm not going to look at it. Um, but if it's just a couple of sentences, I'm going to read it. So that's what I learned. And then that's how I was getting more of a response, the shorter the email and to the point. Did you also put links to your stuff in there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And do you have like a certain number of links you would do or do you, you do like stick to like three or four? I would have a link to my website and then I would have specific links to certain pieces of music I wanted them to hear instead of just going to my website and then listening to whatever they want. Yeah. So if it was like a thriller I was after, I would want them to listen to the thriller stuff, not the comedy. So you would, oh yeah, you would cater this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, wow. No, I think that's actually really, really cool. That's, um, I guess that anyone listening, that's a best way of doing it is you just mm -hmm. keep contacting, you keep hitting the wall. Eventually you're going to break through. That's right. Yeah. And, um, so then segueing that, how how do you approach projects when you're hired as a composer? Can you walk me through like your creative approach? Like what is your procedure? I uh, I get the movie most of the time. It's a lot of TV movies nowadays, so it's um, I kind of already know what's happening. You know, just working with Lifetime movies. Um, <clears throat> usually, I'll have a spotting session with a producer or a distributor. And we'll go through the movie, what they like about the temp music, what they don't like, what they want me to key on, like what moments, things like that. And then I'll just uh, I'll sit on it for a few days, get some ideas going, and then I start, and then I start at it. Hmm. So you do like a bit of a spotting process. Mm -hmm. um, and then in your experience, have there been any like struggles you've run into as a composer? Is there anything like you've come to realize like pitfalls where you're like, man. It depends on the day, I guess. What but, is what is your biggest challenge as a composer? Um, that's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to make them hard. <laughs> yeah, just um, just making sure that I'm hitting like all the moments right. You know, following the direction that I've been given. If there's been direction, um, making sure I'm not uh, overscoring. Overscoring, can you break that down for me? Yeah, so my job is to aid uh, the story. And you shouldn't hear music, basically. You know, I know I've done my job when somebody doesn't comment on the music. You know, and they, you know, you can hear the dialogue, you're focused on the story itself, and it's not like this, oh, that music there really overtook the scene. You know, so sometimes, you know, I get a little excited if it's an action scene or a, <laughs> car chase or something. I'm like, yeah, do, 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 do. And when I go with John Williams style or something, you know, when well, I got to hold back, you know, so that, you know, I'll get a call back from the review team and say, well, we need to take another pass at this. It's too much. Can you, what a review team. Can you break that down? Is a review team just the director and producers or is it like another department? It's, it's the producers. Yeah. So they get back to you and they say, Hey, a little, a little heavy on this and they mm -hmm. give you some notes. I guess then my next question would be, what is like the most constructive note you ever got? Like a note that you remember every time you go back into the studio? Um, it Like overscoring or it's just too much, you know? So I work with a lot of distributors that, you know, go out to like Up TV, Lifetime, Tubi. And they'll, they have like a specific brand you know, like the style, like a music palette. One likes um, 
full orchestral type music. Another one likes more of like a hybrid electronic type score. And if I go with the hybrid electronic one and I do more orchestral stuff, then they're like, well, we need to ease back a little bit. We don't want this to be bombastic mm-hmm. or something like that. Or if it's like a funny scene and, and you know, there's funny music, you can't have funny music because then it's not, it's not funny. It's not mm-hmm. cartoon. Yeah, it's kind of too on the nose, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, in my own experience with composers, you're talking about the overscoring thing. I once had a situation quite similar to that. where I had a film. I had a sequence in the film. The composer kept a little overdoing it, and I had to like instruct them to say, hey, I think for this scene it's actually better if you, if you dip because mm-hmm. you've done such a wonderful job. It was one of the first times I realized a composer's true purpose because I mean, I'd had composers before, but I'd never really like, I just give them the film and say, I want it back and hopefully, you know, better than how I sent it, right? <laughs> yeah. And I, I sent the film, I got it back and there was this one part, just one part where I'm like, you're, you're overcooking. Mm-hmm. And uh, I realized, okay, this composer has done such a wonderful job of walking the audience emotionally through this movie and you've kept me on my toes, you've made me giggle, you've kept me interested, you've, you've really... New, um, what's the word? Nurtured my experience through, but now the film, which was a horror film, the idea was that this one sequence is a cultivation. It's the big scare. It's the mm-hmm. what can happen next. Anything can happen, right? And the music was just too triumphant. The music was too, you know, as you say, bombastic. It was yeah. in your ears. It was it was present. And because the music was present, the moment felt, you know, disingenuous. It didn't feel real. And so I, my, I only know it as a director. I mean, I wasn't even, I'm not a, I can't say I'm a very experienced director. It was a short film. But my only note was, yeah, I think you got to dip. I think you got to cut out because you've, you've nurtured me through this. If you dip, I don't have you. There's no crutch. Mm-hmm. I now stand on my own as the audience and I don't know what happens. And it worked. It actually ended up being a, a popular part of the film that I get still complimented on till today. But that made us, it made us like this, this stain in my brain of, oh, this is where the director composer relationship is valuable because we're both trying to service a vision. And I guess mm-hmm. so turning this into a question, how can you give advice to composers in receiving direction from directors? And then from that, how can you give advice to directors to give advice or give notes to composers? Like what's the best way to go about both of those things? For um, <clears throat> composers because I have two assistants that work for me as well. And my only critique to them sometimes is um, less is more, you know, just hold back a little bit. Because like you said, you know, there's a lot of scenes where you don't, there doesn't need to be music, Mm. you know, especially if the acting is there and it's really good and the storyline is good. You don't need to help it, you know, just let it breathe as is and let the actors have their moment. And uh, then there's a movie where it's, you know, the actors aren't that great. And, you know, I've had that happen quite a bit too, where a distributor's like, we need the music to help the movie. And those are the calls I don't like to get because (laughs) then I'm overstepping and then, you know, then it's too much. (laughs) Overstepping? Like making the music more noticeable than everything else. More pronounced. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I was like, like I was saying, my experience as a, as a young director working with a young composer, there was a, at that situation there was a bit of doubt on the composing side. The doubt mm-hmm. was, "Are you sure?" <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't even know if I was sure. I mean, I was I was the only one making that opinion while watching it on my laptop, going, "Hmm, is this the stronger choice?" And that's what I'm serving for. I'm trying to find that decision that's going to make this film stand out, that's going to make the sequence work, that's going to make the story feel you know, complete and fulfilling. Mm-hmm. And it was a strange note to give. I'd never given that note before, that note of saying, hey, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I think in the sequence, you, you, you're not going to work. <laughs> All right. you got to sit out for this one. you got to sit on the bench, let the team play. <laughs> and it, it ended up working. And the composer did get back to me and, you know, I'm kind of like confirmed my my suspicions. It had I think that actually did work. It worked out really well, mm-hmm. and it made me realize the importance again of trying to communicate well with mm-hmm. a composer. And that was something I've never done. My personal working preference, I don't know anything about music, David. I, I don't know I, anything, literally nothing. But I love music. I'm a music enthusiast, and so I love the the Steven Spielberg approach, 
where he would just give his film to John Williams and he said he would give him this this terrible no good movie and he'd say to you would say to John please save this yeah. <laughs> and then John Williams would bring him a, a film and that's something I really enjoy I really really enjoy that that process of letting a f another essentially another filmmaker mm -hmm. let my vision inspire them and then create something and of course there must be some sort of conversation make sure we're on the same page of what we're going for but then i like to let them have free range and just let them create and make something that i can listen to and then i'll know i also don't like listening to the sound of my own voice so as soon as i hear it and i like it i'm like yeah we're on we're on track right and that's why i guess that's my next thing is you have directors who give bad notes can you give me an like an example of a bad note a note that isn't productive, that doesn't help anyone, something that could be more constructive. So for anyone who's listening right now, who's in that kind of process, they can be guided and they'll know how to approach their composer in a more etiquette way. Hmm. That's another tough one. I, um, you mean like a constructive criticism? Yeah. Like how can a director be constructive? I'm sure you've worked with filmmakers. I'm, I mean, so I would hope. <laughs> You've worked with some filmmakers who were constructive and then vice versa, some filmmakers who you're like, dude, that's not a note. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there was a couple um, times where, you know, the uh, constructive criticism was maybe like too much and you can't take it personal, mm. you know, because you, you're writing music uh, for their movie. It's not your movie. Um, <clears throat> and it's not music for yourself. It's, you know, you're hired to write music for them. But if there gets uh, a point where there's like a lot of back and forth and you're just missing the, you're missing the notes, you know, there's, you know, always be kind. You know, I always try to give a compliment when I'm going to say something constructive mm -hmm. and point out the good things. But then, you know, can we do something different here? You know, I like this approach, but maybe for a different part of the film. Can we take another stab at it? Um, some filmmakers are really good with um, giving examples or using, you know, inspiring words or something that maybe I don't recognize in the scene, you know, or they point something out, you know, that maybe I missed, you know, so that's always a good angle of it. Okay. Yeah. And I guess um segueing this into like the kind of business aspect of it. Cause you work from your home studio. I do. Was that like a, a strong preference? Did it just happen out of convenience? Was it like a result of the pandemic? Were were you kind of relieved that you don't have to live in Los Angeles? Like what was <laughs> the you know, how did that business decision come to be? I really didn't have anywhere else to go and have my <laughs> studio, you know, anywhere. Um, so when you were sending your emails Mm -hmm. through IMDb, all that was happening from Michigan? Oh, yeah. Oh, so you yep. never went out. You I've never went out, yeah. So you stayed, dude, that's okay, that's awesome. Let that be inspiring to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to flee west. You can stay home and just work hard, be consistent, and mm -hmm. you can find work. I would make, uh, you know, I would travel out west a couple of times just to, like, make the connections and follow up with people, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. But as far as living, I always lived in Michigan. I, I don't mean to, to be a little invasive here, but like someone like my, my good friend Ethan here, he went out to Atlanta and he went to go do film work. And he got, he got, a, little, got a little lonely out there. He didn't have his friends and his family. And um, he's been back and he's been happy. He's been surrounded by people he loves. And that's something that I'm trying to, I myself plan to go out there. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to go out there in like January, February of this year. And that was something that I was eager to do, get my start, flee, flee south, I guess in this case. And try find a career for myself and get into the business. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's that's starting to fly away. I don't think that's becoming a standard anymore. And I guess for composers more than anyone, I mean, mm -hmm. I and Ethan, we want to like touch cameras and be on set. Like that's it's kind of yeah. hard to direct over Zoom. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it, um, it has been done. It has been done. As far as I know, it's happened. Um, but I, I mean, it's not my style. But for composers, like mm -hmm. you guys, as long as you have a studio, good equipment, and a good DAW, you're like set to go. Yeah. And I really, I do think this might be the new thing. This might be how it goes forward. Is all composers are probably just going to be remote, living in Ibiza. Right? That might be the move. <laughs> that would be nice. Would you like to move to a place oh, like that'd that? Be, yeah. <laughs> that'd um, be yeah. That'd be swell. Right, that'd be swell. I love that. Well, a lot of, um, I'm sorry, no, the uh, post-production team, 
is spread out all over. So like a lot of people that I work with, there's a company in Toronto, like the movie might be shot in Oklahoma or Kentucky, but the mixing team is in Toronto. Um, the editor might be in LA or Florida. There's a company in Florida that I work with. You know, so everybody's kind of like scattered. Yeah, and I, if you could please help me iron out this this timeline in my head of how it works, because I only have my experience. I've never worked mm-hmm. for a professional production. I've never mm-hmm. had like professional post production work. So I've, I, as far as I understand, when a film's done, mm-hmm. the editor cuts the film first, mm-hmm. and they also cut the audio. Yeah, and then it's moved on to sound design, where the audio gets cleaned up, mm-hmm. and I'm doing it's like a bigger production, obviously. So you have a person who cleans up the audio and you have a Foley artist who does all the sound effects. So you're cleaning the audio, you're adding sound effects. There's also mixing and mastering so Mm -hmm. that the sound when it's on the left and right, it gets channeled properly. When does the composer come in? Are you from the get, if you're speaking to the film, you're finding your way in, but when do you get the cut that you can start composing to? When does that kind of come to fruition? I usually get that when um, the sound design team is getting their cut. So I'm working with post-production at that point. Um, the actors come in and do their ADR work. I'm working on the score. So there's like different stages of, you know, the composing's happening, the ADR, um, dialogue sweetening. You know, they're not mixing the film quite yet. So once all those assets are together, then the mix happens. And are you part of the mixing? No. So you just make the the music, you give them like the final file or do you give them like your project file? Uh, some want the project file. Some just want what's called stems. So stems? if I have like a string section, I'll have like high strings, mid strings, low strings. Um, so that's three stems. And then same with the brass section, woodwind section. So they want the individual instruments as clips with the mm-hmm. cue times for when they start. Yeah, because then that way they can control, uh, because I don't know what the sound design is like mm. or what it's going to sound like, because I get a very rough cut, too. I see a lot of green screens, <laughs> uh, a lot of broken ADR. Sometimes there's moving mouths, but there, nothing's coming out, you know, stuff like that. Or sometimes the, the screen is black, and I just kind of have to know what's happening, you know, because they, they're going to drop in like a stock footage or something. <clears throat> so, you know, the mixer has control you know, if I have like too much bass, but there's like gunshots or something happening, you know, they're going to turn my stuff down because they need to hear the gunshots or whatnot or a loud car or something like that. So they need to have more control in the mix. Okay. So that's something I've always wondered about who gets like final say over the mix and master. So it does come back down to the sound design team. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And do you, are you, is there productions where you're very, you know, open in communication with that team? You're able to like brainstorm ideas and stuff. Is there like a creative collaboration to an extent? Sometimes, but you know, not really so much. They might come back and say, you know, the sound effects or the sound design is a little low here. We don't have much going on. Can you compensate for mm. it? make this fuller or something? You know, and then I'll add something in or whatnot, but not too much. I'm really just kind of alone do my job, send it out. And if there's a problem, I hear back from them. If not, I'm on the next, the next project. Well, you also mentioned you had assistants, right? Mm-hmm. So how do they assist you? Like what is their process? Yeah. So I have them, I write like all the music, the themes and everything. And then I'll bring them in. I'll be some movies. I'm pretty specific on what I want them to work on. I'll have them uh, work on a couple of cues which are, is like the musical piece in a scene. And I'll give them notes and I'll have a screener for them to work on. Then I send that to them. They'll send it back to me and then I'll give some notes. Um, if we're crunching on time and everything, then I just kind of add my own edits on top of it just to save time and stuff. And then we'll send it off. Um, especially like when I'm working on like multiple projects at once, you know, like to have one guy working on one movie, the other guy working on a different one. Myself, I'm on another one. Then I kind of rotate it around, you know, so that I'm able to like send off screeners to the producers to give their feedback. And it's like a constant circle what's happening. 
And so how is the how does the credit work then? How do you guys get credited for that? Are they credited as assistants? They're credited as assistants. Um, I put their names on the cue sheet um, as writers so that they earn their royalties once it airs and stuff like that. So yeah. So that's also how composers get royalties that you have to be credited as a writer on the score, the composition on, on the cue sheet. Yeah. Okay. So I guess my, my question is then, um, you curate with them, mm -hmm. right? And you work as a team. Um, there's something we, we spoke about on the phone that kind of blew my mind. I actually had never thought of it, but we use it. I mean, Ethan and I have used it and that is like music libraries. Mm -hmm. You work f for, or do you just provide music to music libraries that gets used in shows? How did that come about and what is the process like? So I was trying to find ways to um, make money with music. Um, I wasn't getting the jobs of scoring a movie or TV shows or anything like that. So um, I heard of this thing of like making music and uploading it to a website and people buy your music and they license it. And if it lands on a show, you know, you get royalties and you become rich. <laughs> Passive <laughs> income, right? Exactly. That's what it is. Um, Pond 5, I think, was the first one that I started uploading to, and I had like 100 tracks on there. It was just stuff that, you know, you just kind of write real quick and hope it gets picked up. It's you know, like the typical ukulele hand clapping stuff. And it was working for a while, you know, going into some commercials and things like that. And then I discovered other libraries where they actually hire the composers and you audition to get on their team. And so I got hired by two different libraries who cater to bigger productions like Discovery Network and Oxygen, Spike TV at the time and MTV, things like that. And then they give you a brief of what type of music they're looking for. They don't tell you what shows they're working on. So I read the brief, I write the music, you know, different uh, styles of what they're asking for and hope that it gets in. And then once it gets in, then they send me an agreement you know, and then that's exclusively for them. And then maybe a year later I find out, oh, that track was used in Homicide Hunter or some reality show or something like that. It's got to be really cool, right? Yeah, it's kind of rewarding when you, you know, you see it on your royalty statement and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, okay. Can you walk me? How does a royalty <laughs> statement work? Like how often, how, how soon after the the show premieres does it arrive is it like a surprise you have no idea it's coming yeah you have no idea it's coming um sometimes it could be a year sometimes it could be a couple of years afterward i just recently i saw something pop up in my um account and it was from an airing from like 2018 2019 i'm like damn yeah <laughs> I, I, the reason so. i ask is because i'm like you know i spoke with a guy called rob winkworth mm -hmm. and he lectures here at mpi now yeah. And he also runs this new talent agency called Wink Talent Agency. And he represents many like on-screen talent. Mm -hmm. And my question to him was like, how do we track royalties? Like, how do we keep track of these these agreements? Because, you know, I mean, we want to hope everyone's noble and everyone's honorable. Yeah. But like, if you make a commercial and the deal is every time the commercial is aired, there's a fee. We were going to cut six TikToks out of this commercial. <laughs> And every time the TikTok is hitting like a, I don't know, 15,000 views or whatever, there'll be like a royalty. Like, how do you keep track of all this? And his honest answer was, there really is no way. You kind of have to hope that like the grandmother in Virginia while scrolling Facebook comes across the commercial and goes, sweetie, I think I saw you on TV, right? Yeah. And then he can go and make the phone calls necessary to find the, the necessary, like, hey, we think there's little residuals here. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, how do you keep track of that? Because in this case, you're surprised. Do you also, is there how do you keep track of your royalties? And then by the same virtue, do you also feel like there's some royalties that kind of escape you? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So there was a site called, um, I think it was called Competitrack. Uh, Cause when, once this happened where I was watching TV and I recognized my music was in a commercial, it was like a Norelco commercial. Mm. And I'm like, um, wow, how did, how would that happen? And I, you know, every quarter I'd look at my royalty statement and I'm like, it's not popping up. You know, it's a year went by and it hasn't popped up. So then I found out about this competitor track. And you type in the um, 
the commercial, as much in information as you could get from the commercial. And through whatever magic it does, it finds that commercial and you play it and you download the MP3 or the movie file and you send that off to ASCAP or BMI, your royalty or your royalty. And then they do the work and then you find it and then another year goes by and then you start to see the royalties come through. So, you know, there's other platforms like that now, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. That I'm not aware of, but um yeah. No, I appreciate that. I think there's a lot of people listening that I don't think we both know how valuable that'll be to them. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of stuff I'm looking for. You know, that's the yeah. beauty of this process is people like you who have, you've made it, you know, you've, you've got a career. <laughs> You're making passive income as a composer, which mm-hmm. is like the golden goose. Yeah, I'm hoping that a lot of people who can listen to this can kind of take notes here. It didn't just happen overnight. That's right. It took like, you know, a long time, a lot of hard work, mm-hmm. commitment. And now you manage a team. You provide for these libraries and then your music gets to find life of its own, which makes sense because I was looking at these shows. And I was like, why would they not have like a composer? Like, why wouldn't they? And I'm pretty sure it's a budget thing. Mm-hmm. I'm sure it must be more yeah. expensive to bring a composer on and you have to pay for them as kind of like a residency. But then on top of that, it's also the turnarounds. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure these are because most of them are like documentary-esque type shows. So the editing turnaround must be insanely quick. And so if you're looking to find something, also in my experience, it is easier to edit to, to music mm-hmm. than to edit without. It's also a, like, it's not very motivating <laughs> in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so I think that might be the case as well. If someone like you who's talented makes a really cool like espionage track and I'm making a scene that's building up to like this big, you know, plot twist that's got to do with, you know, that kind of industry it could be very cool to have your music and, like, uh, and copy paste and then just cut to that and be like, oh, that's way more motivating. And I feel like I have almost like a template, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And that's why, I mean, it's interesting. Do you, is there, when you're making music for these briefs, you know, how do you exactly do you find inspiration? I guess that would be my next question. They give uh, inspiration in their briefs. They kind of give like a little uh, synopsis of a, not of what the show is about, but something very similar. So I can kind of, I can guess that it's going to be like a detective show or a cooking show, mm. you know. So they give a, like a little paragraph of inspiration to work off of. And then technology. How has technology impacted your process? Because you've been doing this for a while now. Mm-hmm. And also, what, what like what um, DAW do you use? I do everything in Pro Tools. Pro Tools? Yeah. So I started in uh, Cakewalk. I don't even know what Cakewalk is. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but the, I don't think Cakewalk's around much anymore. They switched over to what was called Sonar, and then they sold it off to another site, or not a site, but another company. And um, instead of using two different programs, because I would have to use Pro Tools as like my mixing, you know, I'd dump everything from Cakewalk into Pro Tools and then send it off. Um, but then Pro Tools got better with like musical writing and stuff like that. And I'm like, I'm just going to do everything in one house and just, you know, save time and send everything off through Pro Tools. It's a workhorse. Yeah. And then a lot, like you said earlier, a lot of production companies or the mixing team, they want the project file, Mm -hmm. you know, so, and that makes it a lot easier. And then, yeah. So in, in terms of technology, has there any like, specific technology has been introduced in like the last five years that's really impacted you. I, I, I mean, I don't know if you've had any runnings with artificial intelligence, anything like that. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, back to the uh, music library stuff, you know, I feel like the AI stuff is going to really take over that. Dominate it. Yeah. They're the first ones to go, I think, for, as a composer. Because basically when I get a brief, I look at it as now it's, prompts mm. you know they can type all that stuff into uh suno or udio or whatever ai is coming out and then i can get their track in like 30 seconds you know whereas scoring to picture like what i do now i don't see the technology happening too quick maybe it's down the road but i think there's like that collaborative thing between filmmakers and that's exactly what I was going to follow up with. Yeah. I think regardless of whether AI could do a narrative film, 
it's mm-hmm. going to come down to the filmmaking and producing team and what they feel is best for their film. I have no doubt that there will be films with AI scores that will be good, that mm-hmm. will be objectively good, good composition, good mix. But sure. it's a choice that the filmmakers are going to have to make. Mm-hmm. And the, the reason I know this is I, I have an example that I've been mm-hmm. dying to, to pull out, um, and you're the best person for it. <laughs> There's a film that came out recently called The Creator, mm-hmm. and it's directed by Gareth Edwards, and it stars um, John David Washington, Denzel Washington's son. Um, great sci-fi film. Looks insane. It's all about yeah. AI. It's about a, a world where AI kind of went off the rails okay. and came out, I think, last year. And this film, when Gareth Edwards was directing it, they had to keep it as low budget as possible. I mean, they shot the thing on like a DSLR, a really sophisticated mm. DSLR. But what blew my mind away is because the movie was meant to be this like sci-fi AI thing, he was like, we're going to do the score on AI, like softwares. And so they did. From what I understand, they did that, and they made it sound like Hans Zimmer, from what I believed was Hans Zimmer. I'm actually going to fact check that because I don't want to mess it up. I want to know it. I know it was Hans Zimmer, but just to double check. Hmm. Um, the creator, composer. Bam, put my Wi-Fi on. Hans Zimmer. Yeah, so he he does the score initially with Hans Zimmer like prompts, like, hey, make this sound like Hans Zimmer, you know, yeah. the wah, right? All that stuff. And AI does an impersonation, but it's not good. It just doesn't mm-hmm. work. He doesn't like it. He's like, ah, <laughs> it sounds like someone trying to do Hans Zimmer. Yeah. And so he goes to Hans Zimmer and he's like, hey, I'm so sorry. <laughs> he's like, I apologize. That was wrong with me. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think that's exactly what he said, but Hans Zimmer got a kick out of it, listened to it and said, wow, that's interesting how this thing, this machine, this this entity has interpret- interpreted me. Mm-hmm. And then he made a really kick-ass score that worked way better. So I'm like, that's something I think is, I don't know, I don't know if that protects the, the position, but I'm like, I think the filmmakers, that film made sense to attempt it. Yeah because of the nature of it, mm-hmm. right? You're right. trying to make a story about how AI is in, you know, indistinguishable, but there's still like the human entity, you can't ignore it. And then you have to just go straight to the source. Someone like Hans Zimmer, you're like, oh yeah, we need that. If yeah. there's anything you're gonna spend the budget on, it's Hans Zimmer. Right. And so I just wanna get your, your opinion on that because I think that's I think it's an interesting little like recent, you know, run in the two industries kind of starting to touch heads. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I think there's a lot of, uh, cool things that can happen with it. You know, when it comes to it, when I start looking at AI, I'm like, what tools can I use to help my job with that? You know, but as far as like writing and stuff, then that gets scary, you know. But what I've heard, you know, I've heard some really great things from it, but then also some really, really bad things from it, you know, musically, so... <clears throat> yeah, it's um, it's like I was, I've said this to most people who come on the show. It's it's a tool, whether mm-hmm. we like it or not. The, yeah. you know, I'm sure cavemen were super pumped about hammers when they came out, right? <laughs> it's yeah. it's just we're gonna have to find our way with it. Mm-hmm. There's no other way around it. It's not gonna go back. No, but I, I I'm I'm very positive. I'm very positive to believe that, you know, film didn't die, mm-hmm. and I didn't grow up with film. None of the, as far as I understand, as a child, like none of the theaters I went to were film theaters. Like I, I was raised in the digital era of cinema, and now as a as a young adult, I'm actually kind of impressed by like how prevalent film is. I mean, I volunteer at a at the Redford Theater where they do 35 millimeter projection. Oh, yeah. I just get to watch this machine breathe. Like you know, it's it's very. It's cool stuff. It's very cool, mm-hmm. but I, it made me realize, oh, it's not gone. They all thought it was gonna die. You know, but there's mm-hmm. still so many filmmakers who, don't get me wrong, probably not as many as they were before, but there's a lot of filmmakers who still want to keep it going, want to keep it alive, want to keep it, you know, around. And I yeah. think the same thing is going to happen with stuff like composing, at least my hope. There's going to be creatives who know that it's valuable and there's something special about it. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a part of this creative process is you can have that. You can have that kind of, you know, um, synchronicity where you have a filmmaker and a composer. We know them. Like we know, we know Steven Spielberg and John Williams, George Lucas and John Williams, yeah. Hans Zimmer and Christopher Nolan. And mm-hmm. then right now, Christopher Nolan has a new guy. Um, what's his name, Ethan? The Ludwig Goransson. Ludwig Goransson, mm-hmm. yeah. 
the Oppenheimer score. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> that was um, incredible. A spectacular piece mm-hmm. of composition, the whole thing. And so I'm like, yeah, I don't know how anyone can listen to that and go, oh, AI. So it's all down yeah. now. There's no way. But I do think there are, I mean, I don't know anything about the AWs per se. I've never actually used one. I'm familiar with them because I've worked with people who use them. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's stuff inside the softwares, inside the like the, the way it's structured that AI could be very helpful for. Yeah, there's updates, you know, every month. And now with AI becoming as big as it is, you know, I, I know a couple of DAWs that are incorporating that now. So like earlier I was talking about stems. Um, when I go to export stems, you know, it's a process. It's time consuming. But in uh, one DAW, you can hit a button and it does all the stemming for you, you know, so. is that awesome? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like that kind of stuff is exciting to me, you know. Yeah. Make right. my job a little easier from the mundane type of tasks. and But I get enjoyment, you know, when I'm, you know, scrubbing through and, you know, I might hear a mistake. I'm like, oh, I got to go back and fix that. Yeah. No, the you best know? example I have is, you know, when cars came out, they changed everything. Mm-hmm. Like New York City was dominated by horse and carriage for mm-hmm. like almost a century. And then cars came around and they got rid of horses in less than a century. It all yeah. became cars. Changed the entire structure of that city till today. Mm-hmm. And the thing about that is those were the worst cars we ever made. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that like the funniest part? Yeah. And now we're like cyber trucks. Like <laughs> I, I think... Cybertruck. I think that's kind of, they navigate on their own, mm-hmm. right? They can use satellite, you know, and all that stuff. Like they're, they're eight, they they can self temperature. They can like change the temperature of the car based on the outside. Like they can do all this stuff on their own using artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. My my mind now tells me I think that's what all these softwares that we use, our editing softwares, our DAWs, all these programs, we've been using like the first car version of them, mm-hmm. and they've just been getting better. And now we're heading to a point where they're about to hit like the self-driving car stage where these softwares don't need you to give them 100% input. You can kind of go in there and the machine kind of more intuitively knows how to like figure out what you're going for. So you can work with it and then all you're doing is prompting it and then you're curating it and it speeds up the process. That's my hope. My hope is that it's going to become a more sped up process which allows us to create more and Mm -hmm. create quicker and get better quicker, you know? Yeah. But then I also don't know. I have to be a bit more skeptic. I don't know if that also makes the machine smarter. <laughs> you True. Know? So it's like a, it's a little dance we have. But mm-hmm. um, my, next que- my next question would be, um, you, you've had um, you've had an interesting career, and now that you have a team of, oh, I believe they're, they're, they're younger composers, up and coming, mm-hmm. trying to find their way around. Yep. Do you have advice for young composers in general? trying to like find their way in, trying to figure their way out? Um, yeah, just meeting the right people, <laughs> but trying to find, you know, you know, it's a very uh, blank answer, but um, just keep going and practicing your craft, you know, going to film festivals and, you know, cold calls. You know, like how they found me was uh, they DM'd me on Instagram. They saw that I posted something and uh, my first assistant reached out to me that way and he's from Michigan but he was uh, going to school in Wisconsin and then essentially moved out to LA Um, but he just wanted to pick my brain about the business and we met for coffee and stuff we hit it off and you know a couple months go by and he um, reached back out and followed up and he said well why don't I give you a couple scenes to work on, you know, just kind of get it like a taste and see what you do and stuff like that. And then it just kind of worked. And so we slowly started building that. And then he was working with me for a while and then I just got busier. So then there was this other guy that was, you know, commenting on posts and YouTube stuff and was like, I'd love to get a chance to just kind of work with you and see how you work and stuff like that or chat or whatever. And same thing kind of happened. I'm like, okay. And so I offered him another a position and, you know, now we're all working together and things like that. So it's, you know, with social media now, you can reach out to Hans Zimmer. You know, like I'm on a face group, uh, group with 
other composers and it could be somebody that has no experience and just hobbyist not wanting to do anything and then you see Hans Zimmer commenting on that post you can totally reach out to these guys and you know I see it happen you know I've done it myself on you know Instagram reach out to a composer that I'm interested in learning you know what program he's using or you know stuff like that so it's I want to say it's much easier now than it was, you know, 15 years ago when I was trying to, you know, cold call and do all the emails and stuff like that. But well, there's platforms, the community, yeah. the community is mm-hmm. getting connected. Yeah. Which is, you know, that's kind of like why the show to me was so important is I was like, oh, I mm-hmm. like that. I like the, the new wave that's coming. Yeah. And it's, I, mean, I think it's ready here. I think it's past. I think we're just in the remnants of it right. and we're just figuring it out. And that's, I mean, that's... There's so much more to unpack there, but um, mm-hmm. I want to I want to ask you a personal question, and that is: Is there any memorable experiences? One memorable experience as a composer, something that sticks out, something that you think about, something that you'd like to share with us? Hmm. It could be anything. That sticks out. Not. Not in mind. Good or bad? Yeah, I know it can be anything. Yeah. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> that works too. Sorry. Huh? No, no. It's I, I asked the question because um, where I go with that is, you know, careers in this industry can kind of be a little, you know, spooced up. People get idea to like, it can be very romantic to be in the film industry. Mm-hmm. So I like to find like what do people like what's an experience that you hold on to, because I do believe in sharing that. It's kind of like a, like a you know, double A or an AA meeting sort of effect to it, where <laughs> you have this like you can share a war story and someone can resonate with it and be like, oh, okay, I see, you know. So mm-hmm. for example, a composing experience that sticks out for me was um, seeing like how how well someone could understand my vision. That was something that took me back the first time. I was like, whoa, I didn't know that would, it was even possible. I thought I would have to do a lot more curating. But like finding the right person, mm-hmm. that was like, wow. And then that hope, my hope is with sharing that is that someone will listen to that and go, oh, there is a possibility there's a creative out there who's like-minded in a very different way in terms of talent. Like I'm yeah. a filmmaker, that's a composer, and that person can understand my work so like fluidly. That's kind of my hope with that. I think, um, yeah, there's were a couple of times um, because I don't get to work, you know, side by side with a director much Mm -hmm. because everybody I work with is out of state. Um, So when I get to work with somebody local or we're doing like a FaceTime, you know, meeting with one other specific director I can think of, he's in Toronto, you know, where they're like over my shoulder while I'm writing you know, and the director is like, I like that, but can you change the tone of the note? Can you use a different sound, but use this instrument or something like this? Or they help guide me and, you know, give me like a scenario, take me out of my element and puts me in theirs. And then I come up with this new sound or this new theme and that I wouldn't have been able to do on my own. So that kind of stuff really sticks out and that's memorable i guess you know to me like wow this there's more to it than than this and then just myself doing you know you're really big on the creative process and i appreciate that Mm -hmm. yeah i i like to give this this last little space here to the the guest if you guys want to whenever talk about something there's something you want to put on on blast so to speak there's something you're working on anything like that you want to like kind of navigate people to a link is anything like that not really. I can't talk about what I'm working on right now. Oh yeah, NDAs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we're we're familiar with those in the show. Yeah, but yeah, no, I like to I like to throw it out there as a possibility because um yeah, David, you you've done a lot, and I appreciate you making the time. It was it took us a while to get you in here. Mm-hmm. I'm very glad that we did yeah, because I've I've learned a lot sitting here with you, and I appreciate Good. your generosity with your time. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on. It's fun. It was a pleasure. So yeah, without further ado, I that was a. Uh, Let's talk motion picture. Um, thank you, David. Thank you. Boom. 
This podcast is brought to you by Motion Picture Institute, a film school located in Troy, Michigan. If you'd like to know more about our extensive one-year filmmaking program, please check out the website at motionpicture.edu and schedule a tour today.